project uh, segmentation in low supervision scenarios. Uh, this be, has been a thesis uh, directed by Professor Xavier Giro and Professor Jordi Torres. And yeah, thanks everyone uh, for attending and also for the uh, committee uh, being here. So the main tasks that we address in this thesis are related to image segmentation. Uh, there are many kinds of image segmentation and we are going to deal with both uh, still images and videos. And concretely, we are going to distinguish between two different uh, types of, of segmentation. The first one, which is uh, semantic segmentation. In this case, we expect that the algorithm predicts per each pixel of the image a semantic class category. And then we have instant segmentation. And in this case, this is a little bit more challenging because you also have to distinguish between the different instances that belong to the same category. So here, if there are uh, several people, you would need to distinguish those. So uh, as you may already know, in order to train deep learning systems, uh, lots of uh, data is required. And uh, if you want to train it in a fully supervised setup, you also need uh, annotations. In the case of segmentation, uh, this can mean that a human has to generate a lot of these kinds of annotations, which are very expensive to obtain. Because as you can see here, there are lots of objects and it's a very cluttered scene. And the human annotator would need to delineate all the contours of all these objects. So this is uh, very expensive. That's why in this thesis, we explore different uh, types of supervision. And by supervision, we mean which is the effort required uh, from the human side, both at training or at inference time. And we will um, uh, separate this uh, presentation in three different blocks. The first block is about uh, supervised learning for video segmentation. The second block is about semi-supervised uh, uh, image segmentation. And finally, the third block is uh, language-guided uh, video object segmentation. So first of all, I'm going to explain the paradigm of uh, training a model and using it at inference time so we understand it better. So first of all, uh, we need to define a task. This could be a segmentation task. And we will decide uh, uh, an architecture of our choice. Then in order to train this model, we need uh, lots of data. And if we want to train this in a fully supervised setup, we also need uh, the, the according annotations. Then once the model is uh, trained and it, it, it has full capabilities to work with new images that it, they have not been seen during training, we can use it at inference. So here you have an example. You would input an image and you would have your prediction. So in the first part of the thesis, we will focus on the uh, training part. And here uh, we will uh, train fully supervised models uh, for instant segmentation that are end-to-end -end trainable. As we were saying, in order to train uh, fully supervised systems, we need this amount of data that usually it has to be very large with its corresponding annotations. And th this can be uh, a problem, first of all, because even collecting the data is a, a difficult uh, thing in, in certain domains. And also, for some annotations, you require expert knowledge. Imagine you have uh, medical images and you need a doctor to annotate all of those. Also, uh, you need to uh, set up uh, large crowdsourcing campaigns in order to have uh, the annotations done. So that's why in the second part of the thesis, uh, what we do is uh, we aim at reducing the, the annotation uh, budget required at training, and we will do that uh, by using semi-supervised pipelines. So now let's focus on the second part of, of the pipeline that I explained, on the inference part. So, um, in many tasks that we know, such as semantic and instant segmentation, uh, usually there's no annotation required at inference time. So you have your model and you simply input your, your image and there's no effort for the end user. There are other tasks, such as uh, video object segmentation, which are a little bit more challenging. And in this case, typically, it's expected from the user that it uh, provides some kind of guidance of which objects to follow. And this is the case for one-shot video object segmentation, where the user needs to uh, delineate uh, for the first frame of the video which objects you would like to follow. And then the model has to uh, track them along the sequence. So as you can imagine, this is quite expensive because the, the, the user has to do this, this extra effort at inference time. That's why uh, we also explored zero-shot video object segmentation. In this case, this means that there's no guidance at all of which objects to follow, and simply the, the model has to discover uh, the different objects along the sequence. 
So in the first part of the thesis also, we, are, uh, we develop uh, the first model that is end-to-end -end trainable for zero-shot uh, video object segmentation and that can deal with uh, multiple objects. So as we were explaining these two different alternatives, we have the one-shot approach versus the zero-shot approach. So the second one, the advantage, is that it requires a lower annotation budget by the user because you don't have to do that effort. But on the other hand, of course, the performance we will obtain is lower. That's why in the, uh, that we explore a, a trade-off approach that what we do is to use language in order to describe uh, which objects to follow. Here you, you have an example. Uh, if we have this uh, video frame, we would say, okay, we want to segment this skater with green jacket in the left. And then uh, the model has to know uh, which object to segment along the sequence. So that's uh, our contribution in the third uh, part of the thesis. Here we aim at reducing this uh, required uh, interaction at inference time by uh, using language. So uh, finally here, uh, I'm going to su summarize the different contributions that uh, we planned for the different parts of the thesis. And here we are plotting for both uh, training at inference, uh, the supervision level that we will use, and the performance that we expect uh, from the model. So in the first part of the thesis, we uh, develop algorithms for video object segmentation. And in training, these are trained fully supervised, so a maximum level of supervision. But at inference, uh, we work on the two extreme scenarios, so not having any kind of supervision or having uh, this uh, initial uh, pixel level mask. Then in the second part of the thesis, we focus on the training setup. And here we aim at reducing the supervision that is required at training. And we do that by uh, training semi-supervised uh, pipelines. And finally, in the third part of the thesis, uh, we work with uh, this language uh, model for video object segmentation. And our focus is to reduce uh, the effort required at inference time. So that's why we develop a, a trade-off solution between the zero-shot video object segmentation and the one-shot video object segmentation. So this is the summary of, of the different contributions of, of the thesis. So now uh, let's just start with the first uh, blog that I commented, that it's about uh, supervised learning for video object segmentation. So our motivation for this part is to work with end-to-end -end trainable models, uh, for instance, segmentation, that they don't require any post-processing step. So by this, we mean that the input of our architecture will be the given image or a video, and the output will be directly the, the solution that we would expect from an instant segmentation uh, problem, so that there's no need to add any extra module or any extra uh, processing step. So first of all, let's explain which is the typical architecture for both object detection and instant segmentation. See that these two architectures are very similar. The only difference for instant segmentation is that instead of providing a bounding box uh, for each object in the image, you also need to provide a binary uh, mask. So here you see the typical pipeline. It consists of two different stages. The first stage is an object proposal network that it proposes uh, regions within the image that may probably contain uh, objects. So that are, that are like blob regions that probably uh, may be objects for your solution. Then in the second stage, we have this refinement of the proposals and also we classify them between uh, the predefined um, set of, of uh, semantic categories. And here we would have our output. Here you only see four different proposals with their corresponding bounded boxes, semantic category and score. Uh, but actually this is usually in terms of thousands of proposals. So of course this is not your direct solution and that's why you need an extra step to choose which are the best proposals that better fit your solution. So here we would choose this uh, bonding box for the dog, this for the cat, as these are the, the best bonding boxes and the ones that have a higher accuracy. So what we thought in our work it was, okay, we, we would like to have models that directly predict uh, the solution without having this uh, post-processing step. And our idea was to work with sequential models so that the, the architectures can work in a, in a holistic uh, manner. So here what we did is we have an image and we would like to have a network that first predicts uh, an object and then it, it learns how to reason over this uh, prediction to do the, the following one. So in order to do this, uh, this sequential prediction, we worked with uh, recurrent models uh, for instance segmentation. 
And our main contribution from this part is uh, Arbos, which is a network uh, that it's uh, made for video object segmentation that it's fully end to end trainable. And this is a work that we uh, published in CPR 2019, and it's a joint collaboration with uh, Carles Ventura from Universitat Oberta Catalunya. So first of all, I'm going to explain the model that we developed for instance segmentation. This is a, a work that we did uh, at the beginning of my thesis together with Amaya Salvador, and this addresses uh, instant segmentation. So this works for still images. So here, imagine you have this input image, and then we want to obtain some uh, features from it. Then we have a decoder that at each time step will produce a binary mask of the different objects uh, that appear in the image. And we will also predict the, the semantic category and the uh, stop score. This score will indicate whether there are more objects or not uh, in the given image. So we will know when to stop processing so that we don't produce more proposals than the ones that we actually need. So going a little bit more into details, the encoder is a, it's a ResNet 101. And then the decoder, it's a, a convolutional a decoder made of, of LS, convolutional LSTMs, and they get the skip connections from uh, the encoder part. Then we also have, uh, we, we do a pooling of features from the decoder, that is uh, this one, and this goes connected to some fully connected layers that will uh, do the classification between the semantic categories, also, uh, we'll predict the, the stop score, and we also predicted the bonding box coordinates of the detection because we saw that this gave a little bit of better performance. So now let's go back again to the problem that we want to solve, that it's video object segmentation. In this case, instead of working with uh, still images, we have a sequence, and from this sequence of video frames, we want to obtain uh, the segmentation of the different objects. So as we were saying in the motivation, uh, the typical setup for this problem is one-shot video object segmentation, where you have, uh, where the user needs to provide a pixel level mask of the objects that you would like to follow. And this would be uh, the result expected. But of course, this is uh, quite expensive at, at inference time, and that's why uh, we wanted to explore a little bit more uh, zero-shot video object segmentation, that it means that there's no guidance uh, provided. So now I'm gonna explain the architecture that uh, we developed for this problem, and this is useful for both uh, zero-shot and one-shot uh, video object segmentation. So first, starting with a frame of the video, we have uh, the encoder, that is the same one we had for still images. And then we have this recurrent decoder that at each time step, it produces a mask for the different objects. Uh, we call this recurrency spatial recurrency because this goes along the different spatial regions within a single frame. Then we will do the same for each frame of the video. Until now, you see that this is exactly as applying uh, an image-based uh, model. So this is having the, the RCIS model at each time step. So finally, what we did here with uh, Arbos is to add a, a connection between um, the different time steps so that there's a, a hidden state that comes from the previous, uh, the, a hidden state that goes into the convolutional layers that comes from the previous step. And this is what we called uh, the temporal uh, recurrency. Finally, uh, we also adapted a little bit the architecture when we worked with uh, one-shot uh, video object segmentation, as in this case, we have uh, the mask for the first frame. What we can do is to simply input this mask into the following frame, and we can do that in the whole sequence. So that the network only has to predict at each uh, frame uh, the difference between uh, the last frame and the current uh, state. So uh, now I, I already presented our model, but uh, we are gonna compare to some previous work. And this is the one that is more relevant to ours, which is the sequence to sequence uh, model, which is a recurrent method for uh, one shot uh, video object uh, segmentation. So this cannot handle uh, zero shot uh, as we do. And basically, they have the same idea of having a, a recurrent uh, decoder, but uh, the other main difference is this model works uh, for a single object. So if you want to segment uh, several objects, you need to uh, do the whole processing uh, every, for each of, of the instances. 
So we are going to present results on these two different benchmarks, which are very popular for BB object segmentation, which are uh, YouTube Boss and Davis uh, 2017. So here, uh, let's see the first results. This is on one shot for YouTube uh, Boss. And the evaluation metrics that we will uh, use to compare are the jacquard, which is uh, the intersection over union. This means the overlap between the predicted masks and the ground truth ones. And then F is a contour accuracy metric, so it assesses the, the pixels from the, the contours of the mask. And then we have the seen and unseen categories. Uh, this means that in YouTube Boss, uh, there are some categories that appear both at training and at test time, semantic categories, I mean. And then there are some others that only appear at test time. So that's uh, the difference between these two. And here what we did is to assess our model when it only has a spatial recurrency, when it only has temporal recurrency, or when we have uh, both uh, recurrencies. And here we see that there's an improvement of performance, so both uh, help. And finally, our uh, last configuration is uh, the one that we trained with curriculum learning. So this means that for one shot, we have these masks that we are feeding into the network. And what we did at the beginning is first train it with ground truth masks. And then after some iterations, we started uh, using the predicted uh, masks. So now uh, let's compare to previous work. So here we distinguish between methods that do online learning. These methods, what they do is, uh, given the, the annotations in the first frame, they use these annotations to further fine tune uh, their models at inference time. Our model, it's from this second category. We don't use uh, the, the, the mask to further uh, tune our models. And we see that uh, our model uh, gets, uh, is this one, gets better performance than the ones that use online learning. And compared to the models that don't use online learning, uh, we are competitive to this sequence to sequence model that I was uh, explaining before. We also want to highlight that in terms of inference time, our model is the fastest. And compared to the sequence to sequence model, this is because in our case, we share the features uh, from the encoder for all the objects that we want to predict. OK, so here there's a video. And here you will see uh, the performance. So here first you will see the first frame of the video. And now the masks that are provided by the annotator at the first frame. And this is how our model will follow uh, this mask along the sequence. And here again, as you can see, there are some objects that are not uh, indicated to be segmented, but some others that, that are. OK, so. And now, uh, working on Davis, this other data set that we commented, here we also compare co uh, taking into consideration the online uh, learning methods and the ones that uh, don't rely on online learning. And we see that in this case, the works with online learning work better than us. That actually makes sense because they are fine tuning the model with the weights. And comparing to the uh, ones that don't rely on online learning, we are the ones that get a better performance. And here we tried two different configurations. One is to use the model trained with YouTube Boss directly. And the other one was fine tuning it further with the Davis uh, data set. So now let's uh, jump into this uh, uh, problem of zero shot PD object segmentation. So in our work, we were the first ones to provide results for these two benchmarks that I was commenting on this, uh, uh, about this challenge. And we see that the, the benchmarks at that time were not prepared for this task. Uh, because, for instance, in YouTube Boss, uh, a maximum of five objects are segmented per sequence. So if we don't know at inference time which objects to follow, imagine you have this frame. It has lots of penguins, but only we, we only need to follow these uh, ones. But we don't know that at inference time. So that's why this is quite complicated. Uh, but now, for instance, Davis uh, has a challenge of unsupervised uh, um, video object segmentation. So here you can see the results that uh, we obtained. And in order to better understand these numbers, let's compare this to the one-shot approach. We see that with the one-shot, uh, we obtain uh, significantly uh, better performance, which makes sense both because the task is more complicated and also because uh, this uh, um, annotations issue that I was commenting. So here, let's see an, an example of how does uh, zero-shot work. 
And here there's no guidance, so directly our model will segment the different objects. And you see that it knows how to distinguish uh, them. Also in this case where there are two instances of the same category, because these two are, are, are parrots, it knows how, how to do it. Okay, so as conclusions from this part, we have presented Arbos, which is this uh, fully end-to-end -end, uh, trainable model for video object segmentation, and it can deal uh, with multiple objects. Also, uh, our model can solve both uh, zero and one-shot video object segmentation, and we are the first to report results uh, for these uh, two benchmarks that we are commenting. And finally, uh, in terms of performance, we see that our model is competitive compared to YouTube Boss, and it's a state of the art uh, in Davis. But for us, what is more relevant is that uh, our model uh, was uh, it, it's was the fastest one when we uh, published the work, and still nowadays it's a, a reference model in terms of, of uh, speed. Okay, so uh, this was the first part. Now let's go to the uh, second part of this presentation. And here what we will do is to talk about uh, semi-supervised learning for image segmentation in order to reduce the annotation required at, at training time. So going back again to the initial motivation, when we are dealing with semantic and instant segmentation, uh, we need pixel-wise annotation, which are very expensive uh, to obtain. So there are several solutions. One solution is to use uh, weak annotations, such as bonding boxes or image level levels, in order to train these models, because these annotations are, are cheaper. Or you can use semi-supervised methods, that that's uh, what we used. This means, uh, leveraging a, 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 a few amount of strong label data, which is expensive, and then a larger amount of data that it's completely unlabeled or that it has some kind of weak annotation. So in this part, I'm going to explain the first word that we presented, that is uh, budget-aware semi-supervised semantic and instant segmentation. We presented this work at the Deep Vision Workshop from 2019, and it won the Best Paper Award. So. What we present here is, is a pipeline for semi-supervised learning that it can be useful for both a semantic and instant segmentation. So that's why here we are not talking about uh, concrete architectures, just about the, the paradigm of semi-supervised learning. So what we have first is what we call an annotation network that will be trained with few images that are strongly uh, annotated. And, and then we will use this uh, network uh, to obtain pseudo annotations for all those images that we have completely unlabeled or with some uh, weak label. So um, then we will obtain these pseudo annotations that are completely for free. Then uh, we have a second network that we call a segmentation network that will be trained with both these strong annotations and uh, the free annotations that we obtained in the previous step. And this is the network that will provide us our final performance. So we uh, analyzed uh, this uh, proposal with uh, Pascal uh, benchmark using few images as strongly labeled and a larger amount of images without any kind of label. So here, first, I'm going to show the results uh, we had for semantic segmentation. In this case, for both uh, the annotation and the segmentation network, we use the Deep Lab version 3 uh, architecture that you can see here, which is a, a reference for semantic segmentation. And here, I'm plotting uh, the segmentation quality in terms of mean intersection over union versus the annotation cost. In this case, how many images were strongly annotated? And here we can see the difference of performance between the annotation and the segmentation network. And you see that the segmentation network works better at all the budgets uh, that we consider. So by adding these pseudo annotations, we obtain an extra uh, performance for free. Now we do exactly the same analysis, but this time for instance segmentation. And we use, uh, again, uh, for the annotation and the segmentation network, an architecture that is uh, suitable for this task, like RSIS, uh, our proposed network for uh, semantic instant segmentation. And here you can see, again, uh, the difference of performance between the annotation and the segmentation network. And you see that the gap of performance is even larger. So in this case, uh, having uh, this um, uh, pseudo annotations helps even more. 
So now, if we compare to previous works, uh, here what we wanted to do with our work is uh, to compare to any uh, previous work that, whose focus was uh, to reduce the annotation uh, effort during training. So that's why we compare to, to works considering the annotation budget in terms of leveling time in how many days did it take to train the, 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 the training data set. And this can be either image level levels, pixel level levels, or, um, or pixel wise as the ones that we are using. And here, uh, this line is the one from our results, the one on the top, and we see that for several uh, budgets, so training with more or less pixel level annotations, uh, we get better performance. Okay, and yeah, here you can see uh, some examples of the results with semantic segmentation when we only use 200, 400, or 800 images. And you see that, of course, the more images, the better results. But we can also see that with very few images, we can obtain uh, good results. So now uh, let's uh, talk about instant segmentation. When we wanted to compare to previous works, there weren't many that had tackled this task before. There's this work from uh, Zoe et al that uh, what they did is to try to solve instant segmentation only using image level levels, which is a, a, a very challenging task. And we see that with our approach, we are able to obtain much better performance at the same budget. And we are also able to get exactly the same performance at a lower uh, budget. So now uh, we have talked about this initial setup of having uh, unlabeled data for our semi-supervised uh, setting. And now let's think about another setup. So this time we will use fewer strongly labeled images and then a bunch of images that are weakly labeled. This means that for this uh, second set of images, we will know which class categories appear and how many times do they appear. So of course uh, they will have a related cost, but this is not as high as using uh, pixel level segmentations. So uh, we address this problem for instance uh, segmentation. And as you remember from the uh, previous part, what we use as annotation network is this RCIS uh, network I was commenting. So now that we have this uh, image level uh, levels, we will use uh, what we call weak RCIS. We did a, a slight uh, modification to the architecture so to benefit about the knowledge of how which categories appear in the image. So here, if we know that there are two instances of the chip category, we will input these as tokens at the different time steps so we know uh, which objects to segment. And here you can see the comparison of performance between the initial annotation network and the second one that uh, we propose uh, when we have these weak annotations. So now the question is why? Why does this work better? So the answer is, uh, in the RCIS uh, annotation network that we were using before, uh, of course, uh, there could be some errors, for instance, some misclassifications. Here, there's a cow, but this predicts that this is a horse. So this level, it's not useful. On the other hand, in, in weak RCIS, we know beforehand which is the class category, so we won't uh, make this error. And also, it can happen that we get a low confidence score for some objects, but this won't happen in the weak RCIS because we know also beforehand uh, how many objects appear in the image. So now let's compare these two different uh, setups that I, I commented, the one that uses RCs and weak RCs. And we will do that uh, considering the number of strong labeled images, the number of unlabeled images, and the number of weak labeled images, that these will contribute to the annotation budget. So this budget refers, again, to the days you need in order to annotate the training uh, data. And this is the performance that we get. So we see that for lowest budgets, around 0 0.5 or one day, uh, the weak RCIS is the one that gives better performance because we can have a better annotation network. That is what we need when we have uh, very few images. On the other hand, once we, we uh, have a, a higher budget, uh, we don't need this weak RCIS architecture and we can use the whole budget in uh, pixel-wise annotation. So this is the approach that works uh, better. 
And finally, when we compare to previous works, we see that uh, our different configurations all improve performance compared to it. And this is basically because our approach is, is more straightforward. We use pixel-wise annotations instead of using image level labels, but that's why we think it's worth it to have better quality labels instead of having lots of labels uh, that are uh, not that uh, close to your end task. So finally, uh, as conclusions, uh, we unified the segmentation uh, benchmarks regardless of the training setup and also regardless of the uh, supervision signal. And we always compare the results considering the annotation cost. We experiment with this semi-supervised pipeline that outperforms previous uh, works in Pascal uh, benchmark. And also, uh, we, we see that uh, it's better to have, as I was saying, uh, fewer uh, images strongly annotated instead of having larger amounts of data with weak annotations. So this first work that uh, I presented, then we extended it, and we did this publication about mass-guided selection for semi-supervised uh, instance segmentation that we published in the Multimedia Tools and Applications uh, Journal. So our, our idea here is, again, starting from our proposed uh, semi-supervised pipeline. Here, as I was explaining, the annotation network is trained with a uh, few uh, images strongly annotated, but these images are selected in a completely random way. So here, what we develop is an active learning mechanism to choose which samples uh, we will use to train this initial uh, network. So for this uh, experimentation, we will work with the second setup that we presented, working with instant segmentation, and with the heterogeneous semi-supervised setup that uses weekly uh, label data. So, um, considering the, the previous approach, we have this annotation network, the weak RCs, that gets as input the image and a, a token with the class category, and we have a pseudo label. So now what we will do is to add a fully connected layer that predicts the confidence of this network about the, the pseudo label that it has just produced. And based on this confidence score, uh, we will choose uh, which samples to further annotate. So instead of having this image only annotated with this, uh, the, the class, the semantic category, we will decide to further annotate it with pixel level annotations. And this mass uh, confidence score, it's a prediction of the intersection over union uh, between the, the predicted pseudo level and the ground truth mask. So now let's explain step by step how uh, we did this, this procedure. So first we have the annotation network that I just presented, trained with very, very few random images, in concrete uh, 100 images. Then we will take all those images that we have with weak labels only, and we will forward them through the annotation network in order to predict pseudo annotations and also this uh, mask quality uh, score. Here, uh, with this uh, quality score, we want to decide which of these images that we forwarded uh, through this function, uh, we would like to annotate further and obtain pixel level annotations. So that's exactly what we do. Based on this uh, quality score, we have a selection criteria. We give these images back again to the human annotator and we input them to the training loop of the annotation network. So here you can see examples of images for each uh, confidence score. So these are images for which the, um, the network is very confident. And these other, the ones that are closer to zero, uh, are the ones that the network is not uh, that confident. So zooming a little bit <clears throat> into the different uh, scores, uh, we can see that, for instance, the images closer to one uh, contain very large uh, objects that are in the middle of the scene. And on the other uh, hand, the ones closer to zero, uh, they contain many objects and they are uh, more occluded and, and smaller. So now let's just study which of these, uh, we, we need to know which samples we will select. The ones that the model is more confident about or the ones that the model is not confident at all. So what we will do is we train a different annotation network with each uh, um, mass confidence score and we will compare it to a random uh, baseline, that is the dashed uh, line that you can see here. And we see that uh, there are some scores that improve the random baseline that uh, are belong to an intermediate uh, confidence score. So this means that the images selected, the optimal thresholds, at least when we are working uh, with, uh, sorry, with 400 images, 
are the ones that belong to an uh, this kind of images. So they are neither the, the easiest one, because probably the network already knows how to solve them, nor uh, they are not either the two com like, the images that may be too complex and that the, maybe the network doesn't have the, the, the capacity to solve them. So here you can see we did this experiment, but for several uh, sizes of strong uh, labeled images. And we see that for all of them, uh, our mass guided annotation network gets a little better performance. So the conclusions from this part is that we propose this uh, novel selection mechanism based on IO estimation. And we think that um, IO estimation can be very useful for, for tasks uh, that uh, involve object detection or image segmentation to choose like to do active learning and also to use them as confidence scores. We have performed this random selection. It may seem that random selection is trivial, but actually it's not because with random selection, you can choose, it chooses very varied images within your set, which is something interesting from an active learning point of view. And for instance, we don't consider that uh, in, in our proposal. We actually tried other baselines like uh, dropout uh, baseline, but we saw that this was the best baseline and that our approach outperformed it. And finally, we also did this analysis of which samples are, are better to annotate. And we saw that these are neither the ones that are too complicated or the ones uh, that are too easy for your already trained network. So now uh, let's go to the third and last part of the thesis, which is about uh, language guided uh, video object segmentation. In this case, we focus on uh, the supervision level at inference uh, time. Okay, so as we were commenting before in the first part of the thesis, the most typical setup for video object segmentation is this one shot case in which the user has to provide pixel level annotations uh, for the first frame of your video. Then we uh, work with zero shot uh, approach and in this case the advantage is that it requires a lower budget at inference time but at the expense of having lower performance. So in this uh, part of the thesis, we explore this trade-off solution that um, it exploits a language in order to indicate which objects you would like to segment in your video. And we will do that with what we call, uh, and it's called referring expressions. These uh, linguistic expressions uniquely define uh, which objects uh, to segment uh, in your input uh, video. So in this third part of the thesis, uh, our idea is to first analyze the different benchmarks that already exist uh, for this uh, challenge. And in order to better do this analysis, we do a, a novel categorization of the linguistic uh, expressions. Uh, then we propose RefBoss, which is a model uh, for language-guided video object segmentation. And we see that it's a state of the art for this task. And this is a, a joint collaboration again with Universitat Oberta Catalunya and, and Universitat Pompeu Fara. So here there are the two benchmarks that we will use uh, to, to compare uh, our model. And first of all, here there's Davis. Uh, Davis originally uh, doesn't have any referring expression, but uh, Coreva et al, what they did is to collect uh, this expression uh, and we work with those. The same happens with the actor action data set. So this uh, data set of uh, short video clips contain annotations of the actor who is doing an action and actions, but not full sentences. So there's this work from Gabriel Luc et al, that what they did is to complete uh, the sentence in order to do uh, this task. So first I'm gonna explain this categorization that we proposed, and we define two different criteria. So the difficulty and the correctness of the expressions, and also the semantic information that uh, the expressions have. And what we did in order to analyze uh, the, these categories is we annotated the different authors from the paper, the different uh, expressions existing in these data sets uh, from the validation set. So first I'm going to explain the categories of difficulty and, and correctness. So imagine you have a, a video of a cat with, playing with a ball like this one, and this is the kind of referring expressions uh, that you have. Uh, for us, this is a trivial example because only by indicating the cat, you already know which objects to segment because there's a single cat in the video and the same happens with the ball. So in this case, actually you wouldn't need a full sentence in order to know which object to segment. So that's why we consider this case as trivial. On the, 
On the other hand, when there are several uh, instances of the same category appearing in the video, you need to further describe them in your sentence, like the largest elephant or the elephant in the right. So we consider these cases non-trivial. Then uh, we saw in the, in the data sets that there were some expressions that we didn't consider them as referring expression because they don't uniquely identify the different objects. So imagine that you have the elephant and there are two elephants in the video. Then you don't know which one uh, you need to segment. And we also saw a fourth case that these are uh, grown uh, correspondences between the expression and the segmentation mask. So here we analyzed uh, the distribution of these different uh, categories for the two data sets in the validation set. And we see that there's a large amount of data which is trivial, especially for the actor action data set. So in these cases, probably you don't need full sentences in order to understand uh, uh, which object to segment. Now uh, let's talk about the second categorization, the one about semantic information. And here what we wanted to assess is uh, which is the semantic uh, content uh, that appears in these expressions. So we define two types of semantic information. The one that is image-based, and this means that by only looking uh, at the image, uh, that's uh, at a single frame, I mean, it's enough to know which object to, to follow. And here we have several categories. One is appearance. You can say, for instance, the color or the garments that uh, a person is wearing. Then location, to know where in the image uh, or in the frame you can find the object. And finally, the semantic uh, category. Then we have the video-based uh, categories. For us, these categories are those that you actually need to watch the whole video in order to understand the, the referred instance. And here we would have motion, such as in this case, there's uh, this folk that is skating. So, of course, you could say that with a single image, maybe you can think about that, but if you watch the full video, you will be sure that it's skating and it will be uh, easier as well. We also have this class about object motion, that this means that the referred instance is doing something, some uh, action involving movement to another object. Then we have uh, static, that this means some action, but that doesn't involve any kind of movement. At the same with object static, this means that the referred instance is doing something to an object without involving any movement, such as uh, reading a book or uh, eating a sandwich, for instance. So again, we analyze the distribution of the different categories for the both uh, benchmarks, and we see that there are some categories that appear a lot, such as category, uh, semantic category, appearance, and also motion, especially for the actor action data set, but there are some other categories that barely exist. And this means that probably these benchmarks won't be useful to, to assess if our model is good or not at understanding these kind of expressions. So this is the network that we propose uh, to do this analysis. We, uh, this model works for both still images and videos. And it consists of having first a visual encoder, which is again a Deep Lab version 3, which is this standard network for semantic segmentation. And then we have a language encoder that eats BERT. And we were the first work to use BERT for this uh, exact task. So we didn't have to tailor a specific language encoder for, for uh, referring expressions. Then uh, what we did is to fuse uh, the visual and the linguistic features to generate these uh, multimodal features, and this will be fed into a convolutional layer that uh, will provide us the mask of the referred instance. So first of all, we started evaluating our model on still images. We work with uh, this uh, RefCoco dataset, which is a, 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 a large dataset with referring expressions. And first of all, what we did is uh, to do a, a a small ablation study of our network. So we wanted to know how important BERT was uh, for our model. What we did is to remove BERT at first and simply work with a, a, a bidirectional LSTM, which is uh, an approach that has been done in, in previous works. And we saw that working with BERT actually provides a, a significant uh, boost of performance. Also, what we did is to, uh, because BERT is usually trained with Wikipedia uh, data, and what we did is to fine tune it further with uh, uh, 
uh, referring expressions. And when we did that, we could get a little bit of improvement of performance. So uh, finally, now we are going to compare uh, to previous works. So here you can see that our model is uh, competitive with previous works. Uh, the one that works uh, better at the time of publication is this step that uh, what it does, it's, it's an iterative approach. So once it produces the, the pixel level mask for your uh, language expression, it uh, feeds it again to the input in order to fine tune it. So if we consider that we don't do an iterative approach, we are uh, quite competitive to this work. And now uh, we also evaluated um, our data set on the video task, as I, I was saying. So we see that it works well on images. Now let's go on video without doing any kind of temporal coherence. And what we saw is that our approach compared to previous work that it's this uh, Coreva et al uh, work, uh, we could obtain better performance even without fine tuning on the data set. So this model is trained uh, on RefCoco. Then if we further fine tune it uh, with uh, the mask and the referring expressions of Davis, we obtain a better performance also compared to this Arbos work, which is a recurring work uh, to ours. And uh, finally here we also, um, sorry. Yeah, here uh, we can do, visualize the examples on this um, Davy data set, Davis. Data set, and yeah, you can see some examples of the predictions that we do. Given that there's no pixel-wise uh, guidance, we think that the masks are quite accurate, and also given that this data set is quite challenging in terms of accuracy of, of the mask. And then here, uh, we evaluate our model on the actor action data set, this, this, this other data set, and in this case, we compare considering the precision and the intersection over union that it's like the jacquard. And we see here that our uh, model is the one that gets the best performance compared to previous works. Now we wanted to evaluate a little more why our model uh, was the one working best, especially given that we are not adding any temporal coherence to it. And we saw, first of all, that our model work much better at trivial cases compared to non-trivial ones which is kind of obvious, but given that this data set has so many trivial examples, this biases a lot the performance metric. And then we did another experiment with the actor action data set to assess the, the, the same. So which is the complexity required in order for the network to understand which object we would like to follow. So imagine that for each object that we would like to follow, instead of giving a referring expression, we give us a, a generic sentence like the thing. We saw that by doing this, for the trivial cases, we already got a quite good performance. Maybe this is because there's a single object in the sequence or because it's very predominant. Then we, we did the same analysis with the actor and also the, the action. And we see that, for instance, for the actor, in the trivial case, the performance is very similar to the one we obtain, sorry, um, for the actor action one. So actually there's not a need for a, a full sentence in these cases. But for us, uh, what is more interesting is that here, for the non-trivial cases, when we use the full phrase is when we obtain a boost of performance. So it's in these cases where we can really evaluate if our model is understanding or not uh, language. Finally, we did also some experiments with the uh, semantic categories that we had defined. In this case, we will work with the categories that appear most in the data set, which are appearance, location, motion, and static. And what we did is the following. So for each uh, video, uh, we made sure that we had a referring expression that included the appearance category and that didn't include the appearance category. And the same with the other ones. And the way to do that is that we annotated, we augmented the data set with uh, more referring expressions. And here you can see the results we obtained in terms of mean intersection over union for the image-based categories. So when the referring expressions are based on appearance and on location, the performance is uh, better. So probably the network has a, a bias towards this information. And here you can see some uh, visualizations on this. So uh, here there's an example of, of including appearance and not including appearance. And you can see that um, 
okay, this is the opposite actually. So the appearance is here and not here. And when we know the appearance, uh, it works uh, uh, better because it knows to segment this uh, kit. And then the same happens with location. So when we know the location, we, we saw that uh, the model knows better uh, what to segment. So here we have uh, the same analysis for the video-based uh, categories. Here what we see is the following. For the motion category, it seems that the performance is more or less the same for both. And for the static category, it seems that when referring expressions are based on this information, uh, it works uh, worse. So here you can see an example. Here, uh, when we have a referring expression based on the motion, it works worse than when it's based, for instance, on the location. And here, for the static case, the same. So when we have the, uh, the static category, actually, this is not helping, and, and the segmentation is, is bad in both cases. So finally, from this part, we have presented RefBus, which is this model for language-guided uh, video object segmentation. This is, uh, model is competitive for image and state-of-the-art for video object segmentation. We proposed this uh, novel categorization and we augmented the referring expressions uh, for actor action dataset in order to do our analysis. And finally, by uh, analyzing current benchmarks, we saw that the, the performance metrics are biased towards these trivial cases. So uh, probably this doesn't reflect the challenges posed uh, by the video task. So uh, finally, conclusions from uh, the whole uh, presentation. Some uh, messages from the first part. So uh, here we, we were able to develop end-to-end -end, uh, trainable models uh, for object localization, and this can be done with recurrent neural networks. Uh, we have seen very recently papers that what they do, instead of working with uh, recurrent neural networks, they work with uh, transformers. And actually, there's this work, for instance, that it got um, competitive performance with uh, previous methods, which is quite interesting because it goes along these lines of not having, not needing any post-processing step. And we've seen, uh, we think that this is an interesting line of research too for video. There are some uh, efforts already in that uh, direction as well. From the second part, uh, we see that uh, when given a, a new task, if you have a, a data set to annotate, maybe it's better to uh, have fewer images uh, with how high quality annotations instead of having larger amounts of weekly uh, labeled data. And we saw that thanks to this paradigm, we were able to train models with uh, very low uh, annotation uh, budgets. Also, uh, we defined a strategy to see what samples to strongly annotate. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, the samples are those that are neither too easy or too complicated uh, for the network. Finally, uh, in the third uh, part, uh, we studied this language-based uh, interactive system that it's a good uh, trade-off uh, between uh, zero and one-shot video object segmentation. And we also saw that for video benchmarks, our frame-based model that does not exploit temporal uh, dimension uh, could be state-of-the-art. And this is basically because of the nature of this uh, challenge. So that's uh, why uh, we think that in, in the future research, it would be interesting that models addressing video evaluate, especially on those uh, cases in which it's important to really understand uh, language to define uh, the segmentation mask. And finally, just saying that uh, these are the different contributions that we did, and we think that in the future, this effort of trying to reduce the supervision required at both training and, infer and inference, it will go on, because this uh, segmentation is a quite important task for many different applications, and it still has this problem of the, of the annotations that are pixel-wise and are very expensive uh, to obtain. So that's why we think that there will be still efforts on this direction. And here you can see the list of uh, publications from the first and the second part, uh, also with the links of the open source uh, projects that uh, we have online. Here from the third part and also as product of uh, other uh, research activities. And that's all. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>